Good afternoon and, and welcome to everybody. Uh, for those of you whom I don't know, my name is Steve Slick. I'm the director of the Intelligence Studies Project here at the University of Texas. And it's really uh, a great honor and a challenge. I've enjoyed my first year here very much. And today is really a highlight. Um, I just want to explain very briefly some of the choreography for our lunch today and uh, let everybody get back to their meals uh, in just a second. So for some of you who don't know, we're at the midpoint uh, in a long conference that we're, we're holding throughout the day. We're focusing on the supervision and oversight of U.S. intelligence. And we're very delighted to have with us today one of the president's uh, senior most advisors to deliver keynote remarks. And we'll get to those remarks in just, just a few minutes after we get through the salad course. Uh, now, some of you uh, participated in our morning panels downstairs that I thought went really, really superbly. But for those of you who joined us late, I want to just say a few thank yous, uh, if I may. So thanks to an extraordinary group of current and former officials and journalists who traveled from Washington, D.C. to participate in the conference. It's really a terrific assemblage of, of expertise and, and wisdom and, and really uh, great accomplishment. These are busy people, and we appreciate them all taking the time uh, to come join us today. I also want to extend a special welcome to our visitors uh, from throughout the UT system. Now, many of you will remember last fall that uh, the UT system chancellor, Bill McRaven, our good friend, who, by the way, sends his regrets. He wanted to be here uh, with us today. He charged us to create something he called the, the UT Network for National Security. And so we've taken that charge very seriously. And this event today is a bit of a sampling of that. So we've invited our colleagues from the University of Texas El Paso, faculty and students, University of Texas Dallas, and also the University of Texas in the Rio Grande Valley to join us. And hopefully this is the first of many opportunities where we can uh, share expertise and, and come together for the benefit of the students. So I want to mention also that this conference is being co-sponsored by the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, the Clements Center for National Security, the LBJ School of Public Affairs, the Center for Politics and Governance, as well as the UT Student Veterans Association. So I'd like everybody to uh, get started with your lunch. In about 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to come back here. I'm going to introduce Lisa. Lisa is going to deliver remarks, and then I'm going to sit here, ask her a few questions, and you should think of questions as well. We want to leave at least 15 or 20 minutes at the end for you to talk to the Homeland Security Advisor. So anyway, please enjoy your lunches. Oh, is it on? OK, great. Thanks. Hello, can I have your attention again? We're going we're gonna to get started so that we have adequate time at the end for questions. Uh, I'm getting my exercise running back and forth to the stage. Uh, please, everybody, you know, continue eating uh, quietly, uh, if you don't mind. I'm going to introduce our speaker, and we'll get started here. So um, great. It's really a privilege, personal privilege and an institutional privilege for us to welcome Lisa Monaco to Austin and the University of Texas. Since March 2013, Lisa served as the Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, and also as a Deputy National Security Advisor. So this is one of the least well-known but most influential posts in our government's national security architecture. It's also, I can attest, a, a relentless and exhausting job. And, and Ken Weinstein, who's sitting across the table, can vouch for that because he's held it. And so we're particularly grateful that you took time out of your busy schedule to travel to Austin. We're looking forward uh, to your remarks. And um, hopefully, we'll, we'll be sufficiently hospitable for that. <laughs> Um, so Lisa moved to the White House just to complete the biography uh, from the Department of Justice, where she served as the Assistant Attorney General for National Security. Uh, Ken also held that job. Uh, but you'll remember that that was one of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, was to create this uh, new Assistant Directorship, or excuse me, Assistant Attorney General position in the Department of Justice. And before that, she had worked at the FBI as the Chief of Staff to Director Robert Mueller. So Lisa is a graduate of the Harvard University and the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, and just a last personal note, I can testify personally that Lisa is, is an absolutely exceptional public servant. She's earned the trust of her counterparts across our government and also across the global community of states that are cooperating and combating terrorism. And as we'll get to in our questions, that's an increasingly uh, important set of relationships 
and responsibility. So with that, I'd ask you to please join me in welcoming Lisa Monica. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Thank you so much. It's uh, great to be in Austin. It's particularly great to be outside of Washington, D.C. Can folks hear me here? Um, thank you, Steve. Yeah, it, as I said, it, it's really terrific to be here. It's great to be uh, with so many uh, old friends and colleagues. I joked last night I could hold a meeting in the Situation Room right here in Austin because we've got so many former officials. I also want to recognize uh, the members of Congress who are here in particular, Chairman McCall, who's been a leader on homeland security issues that frankly have run the gamut from cybersecurity to countering violent extremism. I particularly want to thank Steve, uh, thank uh, Bill McRaven uh, and the University of Texas for bringing me to Austin and Admiral Inman uh, for hosting uh, me at a dinner last night. In the just three years, that uh, since its founding, the Intelligence Studies Project, uh, under Steve's, I think, very able guidance, has done a great service uh, by exploring critical issues uh, that are uh, essential for our security and, I would argue, uh, for our democracy. And I think today's conference is just another example of that. The leadership here at UT, uh, I think exemplified by Admiral Inman, uh, by Bill McRaven, by Steve, uh, they're a great reminder, I think, of the value of public service. So let me just uh, take a minute and make a plug for any students who may be here or may be watching uh, to consider a career in government. You've got tremendous examples for you uh, here on the UT campus, and we need your help to solve many, many very complex challenges, many of which we'll be discussing here today. The great reward, I think, of public service is being part of something uh, considerably larger than yourself. One thing I've learned in my time in public service is that the national security challenges that we face only seem to be getting bigger and more complex. And of course, we cannot take our security for granted. The world received a very painful reminder of that just last week when terrorists viciously attacked Brussels. As the President said, we stand in solidarity with the people of Belgium and we will do whatever is necessary to support them as they bring those responsible to justice. In the minutes after the first blast in Brussels, just as in the minutes after the attacks in Paris, in San Bernardino, and the horrific Easter bombing in Lahore, we immediately ask, what do we know? What are the links? How can we stop the next attack? And we turn, when we ask those questions, to the tireless and courageous men and women of the intelligence community and to our partners. And we turn to them to answer those questions. Now, of course, it's still very early in the Belgian investigation. But what we do know is that there are clear links between the terrorists in Brussels and those in Paris, that they were supported and enabled by networks that overlap, networks that require intelligence to uncover. So the horror in Brussels reinforces the importance of accelerating and expanding intelligence sharing with and among European partners. European partners, frankly, who face an unprecedented threat from almost 40,000 foreign fighters who've traveled to Syria and Iraq from more than 120 countries, including at least 6,900 fighters who traveled from the West, roughly 250 of those from the United States. In the wake of Paris and now Brussels, we're doing all we can to help transmit the lessons we learned after 9-11. We're encouraging partners to strengthen their ability to disrupt plots, by continuing to break down barriers to increase cooperation and intelligence sharing among agencies. And importantly, to do so consistent with the rule of law. So that brings me to today's subject. Seven years ago, President Obama captured the guiding principle that has shaped our own approach 
to these challenges. He said, we will safeguard what we must to protect the American people, but we will also ensure the accountability and oversight that is the hallmark of our constitutional system. Since then, we have witnessed rapid technological change. In 2009, ponder this, smartphones were a relatively new phenomenon. Twitter users were 2.5 million uh, tweets a day. Today, that number is over 500 million tweets per day. Snapchat and Telegram did not exist. In short, the digital ecosystem is very different now than it was then. Now, this presents both opportunities and challenges for the intelligence mission. Front and center among those challenges is ISIL's use of one of the greatest innovations this country has ever produced for the world, the internet, to recruit, radicalize, and mobilize individuals to violence. In the United States, the digital transformation has re-energized an age-old uh, challenge and debate about balancing our security with the privacy and civil liberties guaranteed by our Constitution. It has raised profound questions about the relationship between citizens and government, and at the center of all of these discussions is the role, I would argue, the indispensable role of our intelligence activities and the professionals who perform them in safeguarding our national security. So today, I want to talk about how intelligence helps to keep us safe, the challenges our intelligence community faces, and how we continue to strengthen our national security by enhancing transparency and oversight and adhering to the values that we cherish as Americans. Since the dawn of our republic, the uh, intelligence has been uh, a, a vital part of our security. George Washington had agents send secret correspondence to track the movement of British soldiers. During the Civil War, Union spies in hot air balloons surveyed enemy encampments. Fundamentally, the purpose of intelligence activities, whether collecting secrets, analyzing disparate pieces of data, or carrying out clandestine activities, the purpose has been to, pro to uh, protect the people of the United States, to provide the United States with unique insights to avert disaster and war. Simply put, intelligence allows us to take actions that save lives. And to the dedicated men and women of the intelligence community, I want to say thank you. Working in the shadows, across administrations, without praise or recognition, their professionalism, dedication, and patriotism has enabled us to enjoy relative security since 9-11 and their efforts have most assuredly helped thwart attacks around the globe. But it has not always been easy. It's important not to forget the remarkable transformation our national security organizations have undergone over the past nearly 15 years. New legal, structural, and cultural barriers have been broken down. They were barriers that had grown up among law enforcement, intelligence, military, and homeland security professionals, changes made across administrations have had sweeping impact far beyond counterterrorism, extending to cyber and counterintelligence. And I've seen those changes firsthand at the FBI, the Department of Justice, and now at the White House. And at each step along the way, I've seen how careful our national security professionals have been to develop the tools and capabilities needed to keep us safe while valuing appropriate oversight and a durable system of checks and balances. Now, those changes have included developing new capabilities, new oversight mechanisms, and above all, integrating information across our government. At the FBI, thanks to the work of Bob Mueller, as has been mentioned, and many others, the Bureau was transformed from a solely law enforcement organization focused on investigating crimes after the fact to an intelligence-led, threat-driven national security organization focused on disrupting and preventing the next attack. At the Department of Justice, thanks to the leadership of Ken Weinstein, who's here, 
In 2006, the newly created National Security Division brought together intelligence and law enforcement tools to confront new threats. And under Ken's leadership, NSD took on an important oversight role as well. And today, we're applying lessons learned in the counterterrorism fight to the cyber threat. We see this in the establishment of what we call the CTIC. Every organization needs a good government acronym. The Cyber Threat Intelligence Integration Center. And the purpose of that is to bring together the intelligence community to connect the dots about cyber threats and create a common picture for policymakers about the cyber threat we face today. And at the CIA, Director Brennan is integrating the agency's expertise on the most pressing challenges that we face. The mission centers he's established bring to bear the agency's full range of professional and technical expertise, operational, analytic, support, technical, digital. All of them are brought together to confront uh, the issues that we face. And here, too, the lessons from our counterterrorism experience are being applied. Now, the success uh, of these changes would not have been possible without the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. And I want to commend our longest serving DNI, Jim Clapper, for his outstanding leadership, integrity, and vision in making the intelligence community more integrated and more collaborative than ever before, in encouraging information sharing, transparency, and innovation. And thanks to the courage and dedication of intelligence professionals from across two administrations, we've succeeded in averting further large-scale catastrophic attacks on the homeland. But as the structure of the intelligence community has evolved, so too has the role of intelligence. Each morning, the President's national security team reviews the latest intelligence and assessments synthesized from across the globe and from all forms of intelligence, from human assets on the ground to signals in the sky to the proliferation of open source information on social media. And the topics reflect a dizzying array of threats. Terrorism, cyber attacks, ISIL, Iran, North Korea, Russia, pandemic threats, and economic instability. Now, needless to say, none of us on the President's national security team could do our jobs without the insights and the judgment of the IC. That's because the intelligence community tells it like it is, unbiased, independent, and free of politics. As a policymaker, I cannot understate the importance of this kind of unvarnished, rigorous, and thoughtful analysis. The president demands exactly that, and every president should. Whether it's warning of an attack, assessing an adversary's plans and intentions, or identifying strategic vulnerabilities, that objectivity has made the intelligence community indispensable across administrations. It's also why intelligence is a key element of national power. It's an asset policymakers can harness to advance our interests. In recent years, intelligence has exposed Russia's role in the downing of Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, provided insight into Syria's horrific use of chemical weapons. During the Ebola crisis, satellite imagery helped doctors and aid workers in West Africa track and contain the spread of the deadly virus. So the role of intelligence has never been more important than it is today. Unfortunately, the sensational nature of a series of unauthorized disclosures in 2013 sparked controversy for the intelligence community at home and abroad. Now, I want to be very clear. There is an essential role for a responsible media to investigate, question, and report on government activities, including intelligence activities. And while sparking some important debate, many of the disclosures lacked appropriate context and facts. In many respects, they fueled some misguided criticisms and damaged relations with our closest partners. Precisely because we face threats from terrorists, from proliferators, from cyber actors, threats that aren't going away, it's important that the intelligence community, to be effective over the long haul, has to maintain the confidence of the American people. So we've taken several steps to maintain trust and confidence with the American people and partners around the world. 
And to be clear, as the President uh, has said in addressing some of the more overstated claims, the men and women of the intelligence community, including the NSA, consistently follow protocols designed to protect the privacy of ordinary people. They weren't listening to every phone call, weren't collecting every email, and when mistakes were made, as is inevitable in a human enterprise, as the President has said, corrective actions were taken. And often lost in the discussion is that oversight of surveillance activities by all three branches of our government is unique and valuable to our democracy. And recognizing this fact, this administration, long before the first disclosures came to light, welcomed vigorous oversight of our intelligence activities. But it's the case that these disclosures revealed methods to our adversaries, including terrorists bent on attacking us, that led them to change tactics and could impact our operations for years to come. But ultimately, I think, the greatest damage may well have been the mistrust created between the American people and their government and between the United States and our closest partners and allies. So in response, because we believed it was the right thing to do, over the last two years, we worked with Congress, privacy advocates, industry, foreign partners, and the intelligence community to increase, where appropriate, transparency about certain activities and to reform others. But you needn't take my word for it. Last month, the Independent Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board noted that, and I quote, important measures have been taken to enhance the protection of Americans' privacy and civil liberties and to strengthen the transparency of the government's surveillance efforts without jeopardizing our counterterrorism efforts. And I want to take a moment to extend my gratitude and that of the President to David Medin for his leadership as chair of that board, as well as to Rachel Brand and Beth Collins, who are here with us today. By laying out in black and white the principles that have and will continue to guide how we gather signals intelligence, government can be held accountable. These principles make clear, for instance, that far from being a lawless enterprise, our signals uh, collection activities must adhere to the Constitution and other relevant laws and policy. They must incorporate privacy and civil liberties considerations into their planning, and they must be as tailored as possible. The principles make clear that we collect intelligence only where there is a valid intelligence or counterintelligence purpose to do so, and not to provide competitive advantage to US companies or to suppress dissent or disadvantage anyone based on their ethnicity, race, gender, sexual orientation, or religion. So what specific steps have we taken consistent with these principles? First, thanks to the leadership of many on Capitol Hill, including Chairman McCall, last June, Congress passed and the President signed the USA Freedom Act. Among other things, the Freedom Act ended the NSA's collection of bulk telephone records under Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act, while ensuring that the government has access to the information it needs to protect national security. It also allows the FISA court to hear independent uh, views on new or significant legal questions, and it mandated additional public reporting about government surveillance. All of this was in keeping with the unique and important role that the Congress plays in overseeing intelligence activities, a role I would note that the executive branch welcomes because it strengthens public support to know that their elected representatives have considered the implications of these activities. The president also issued a new policy directive, Presidential Policy Directive 28, to govern our signals intelligence activities at home and abroad. This directive strengthened executive branch oversight of intelligence activities in a number of ways. It set forth limits on the use of SIGINT collection in bulk while preserving its use to combat counterterrorism, proliferation, and other threats. It required senior government leaders to carefully and rigorously weigh the value of the information collected relative to the diplomatic, security, and economic risks of conducting those activities 
if they're exposed. This directive also took the unprecedented step of extending certain privacy protections enjoyed by Americans to all individuals regardless of their nationality. And I'd note that a number of the countries, including several who criticized our intelligence practices, have not taken the same steps. Finally, we increased transparency so the world can see how we're working uh, to follow through on these commitments about balancing privacy and uh, security. Every year, the DNI now publishes something called the IC on the record. It's a report that tracks progress on the reforms that have been made. And this includes posting annual statistics on the use of certain national security authorities and posting declassified FISA court opinions. Too often, the perception is that those of us in national security don't value transparency. In my experience, some of the strongest advocates inside the government for transparency and accountability have been the leaders of the intelligence community. We see this in the CIA's historic declassification of 2,500 PDB articles from the Kennedy and Johnson administration that was done here in Austin just last fall, and there are additional releases planned this year. We see it in the DNI's first ever publication of the Principles of Intelligence Transparency Plan, and we see it in the recent commitment to release an assessment of combatant and non-combatant casualties resulting from strikes taken outside the area of active hostilities since 2009. Now, all of this is not about transparency for the sake of transparency. Transparency and oversight allow the public to have a more informed understanding of intelligence activities. And this is crucial to maintaining the legitimacy of these programs and the public's support for them. At the same time, greater transparency poses challenges for the intelligence community and must, I say must, be balanced with the need to protect sources and methods. So we must ask ourselves, how can we be more open about our counterterrorism operations without giving ISIL insight into our tradecraft and into our procedures? How can we share more details about intelligence activities without jeopardizing vital capabilities, without breaking commitments with foreign partners and losing their trust? There are no easy solutions. We ask a great deal of those in the intelligence community who keep us safe and who keep our prosperity secure. They have to be right 100% of the time. Their skills and ours as a nation are truly exceptional. And I think even the skeptics would agree that the threats we face are very real and the, at the intelligence serves a vital role in confronting those threats. But intelligence can't function without secrecy. So making sure we ask ourselves the tough questions and ensure rigorous oversight is the way that we educate ourselves, we broaden our thinking, we discuss and debate, and we often disagree. Ultimately, I think this is what the UT SEAL describes as the guardian genius of our democracy. And I think it's the way that we'll achieve the liberty we value and the security we require. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. That was terrific. Thanks. Either chair you choose. Okie doke. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. That was uh, tremendous. I think you must be doing some good intelligence work yourself since you've anticipated all of my questions. Oh, good. Uh, that won't stop me from asking them again just to see <laughs> if I get the same answer. It's an old case officer ploy. Um, terrific. So, let you get your water. Thanks. Um, you mentioned at the outset Brussels, uh, mm -hmm. and clearly that's on everybody's mind. Uh, if it weren't otherwise, the media is, is making it so. Um, and we understand that the investigation into what actually happened, what led up to it, is still uh, underway. But even so, it seems to me, and this is a conversation we were having with Chairman McCall that I want to open up the rest of the room, it seems several facts are already uh, apparent. Uh, so we learned that the Islamic State has the capacity, wherewithal, and the intent 
to deliver a uh, highly complex, coordinated, and lethal uh, attack in the heart of Europe. So that's, that's fact number one. And it also seems, without piling on uh, to our allies who, who need our help rather than our criticism right now, uh, that the Belgian authorities performed poorly. Uh, they were not in a position to exercise uh, their responsibilities, and, and now they're playing catch up. What can you say briefly about, uh, even at this early stage, uh, what we've learned, what the Belgians and other Europeans really have to do, what role we can play in helping them get to where they need to be, and then to Chairman McCall's uh, responsibilities, uh, how do we need to think about our assessments of the organization and how we're, excuse me, and how we're uh, preparing ourselves here at home? So, I think that it's a fair assessment at this stage, and the Belgians themselves have said that they missed opportunities. And there'll be time uh, for lots of looking back and evaluating that, which is right. Uh, it's proper. It's what should happen. Uh, I think there's no doubt that, uh, as I said in my remarks, the Europeans face a, a threat that is different in kind than the one we do. Um, the foreign fighter flow is, as I described, uh, quite significant. The land routes distinguish the threat they face uh, from the one that we do. I would say, just bracketing that for, for a second, uh, are, uh, the thing that I am focused on, I know the chairman is focused on, is also, though, in addition to the foreign fighter threat, the capability of individuals to be radicalized sitting where they are, uh, here and elsewhere, without the need to travel, but being mobilized to violence via the internet. But in terms of what are your European partners need to do, I think it's fair to say that uh, they have not uh, had the same um, uh, reaction that we did after we had 9-11, which was to create the structures that drove us to, and you were part of this, as were others in this room, to share information amongst ourselves uh, and to get in a position to very rapidly share it with our international partners. So for instance, as has been mentioned, the Belgian uh, in Brussels itself has um, uh, over a dozen different police forces. Uh, the uh, French uh, face a challenge in terms of sharing information between their intelligence services, their internal services, and uh, their judicial and, and police services. Uh, those types of walls are things that we uh, manage to break down and overcome through, again, legal means, structural means, like the creation of the National Security Division, and frankly, cultural changes to get us to a place where our first disposition is to share information and create a common picture. The, uh, our European uh, allies and partners have got to get to that place and then be able to share both within their own services, within their individual countries, and then across borders. Otherwise, we won't get ahead of this. Terrific. Thank you. Um, turning now to transparency. You, mm -hmm. you mentioned transparency or openness as, as some would uh, prefer. First, I guess I should open with a confession. Uh, after uh, a couple of decades uh, serving in the CIA as an operations officer, mm -hmm. I will admit I didn't see this coming. And uh, transparency and openness were not particularly high priorities of mine. No. Um, I had other responsibilities. <laughs> but, uh, but I shared, along with many people in the intelligence community, a, a certain reaction and imbalance uh, after the Snowden revelations, mm -hmm. that the public reacted in the way that it did. There was a sense that uh, the explanations provided by the intelligence community for what they were doing uh, the particular programs that the public was just learning about through these unlawful um, disclosures were unfamiliar and a little bit unsettling mm -hmm. to the American public. So there had been a disconnect for them. And it's a natural response, it seems to me, to be more transparent and open and help the American public uh, understand what we're doing. As you said, though, the, the parameters of that, how far we can go, remain to be determined. The most interesting aspect of this for me and, and for us in our seminar that we've been leading this year has been that added very exceptional piece that you mentioned in the President's remarkable uh, January 15th uh, speech at the Department of Justice that I, I'm certain you had a hand in, in drafting and the, the policy directive that he issued mm -hmm. at the same time. 
And that was the recognition that the American intelligence community needed to create a different bond and relationship of trust with foreign publics to protect ourselves. And therefore, we would extend to them certain rights that had previously been uh, understood only to apply to Americans. Now, for, for career intelligence professionals, that's, that's a large gulp. That's yeah. a lot to take in, a real paradigm shift. Can you take us inside the debate a little bit? What was the benefit you saw from this? What were the hazards you acknowledged? And, and you know, what, what led to this really rather extraordinary declaration? So uh, it's, and you're quite right about um, the, the process in getting there and, and, and working through, as somebody who has worked in government my entire career, in the intelligence community, as a prosecutor in law enforcement, um, it, it is a real adjustment. Um, but so too was confronting the torrent of information about very complex programs uh, that nobody had thought how to explain and uh, make accessible uh, to the American people because that was not uh, that was not the plan going in. Um, and so some of the considerations were, frankly, the different time that we're in. The reactions to some of the disclosures were much more um, pronounced uh, internationally amongst some of our key allies and our partners. And frankly, it affected cooperation. Mm -hmm. And that goes to the heart of our own national security. We are not in a world, we are far from an island, uh, and they need our cooperation, we need their cooperation uh, to share information uh, and to do so rapidly and without a concern that the political branches will be questioning them later and then having them hold back. So being in a place where we maintain trust from our international partners became quite important in addition to addressing the domestic uh, issues and questions that were arising from, uh, from the United States. So we had partners who all of a sudden uh, whether they're intelligence partners, uh, law enforcement partners, who are facing themselves constraints in sharing with us because of the backlash internationally on either their cooperation with us heretofore uh, or the uh, representation about uh, intelligence activities by the U.S. government abroad. So there became an imperative also to uh, change the dynamic uh, and extend uh, more protections, again, consistent with our own abilities to continue to do our foreign intelligence mission. There was a, rec you ask about the debate, there was a recognition from the get-go that uh, these were uh, decisions as a matter of policy. They were not legal requirements, as folks in this room well know, but there were determinations to extend as a matter of policy the benefit of which outweighed any hindrance it would, uh, it would do to our own intelligence gathering activities, all of which remained paramount uh, along the requirements that I mentioned in my remarks. Thanks, that's great. If I may just follow up quickly yeah. on that. So we've had a, a year of experience with this now. Mm -hmm. How would you assess uh, the feedback? I mean, do we, do we sense a greater willingness to cooperate? Was the trust that we thought we would earn uh, been evident. You did mention that none of our allies has necessarily reciprocated mm -hmm. one for one by extending these protections to us. But A point we hasten to make in many <laughs> engagements. But anyway, so how do you see it after a year? Uh, what, it was a gamble in certain respects. You didn't know how they might react, what the consequences would be. What have you found? Well, so first, again, um, uh, none of the decisions we made about extending certain protections uh, we did so uh, with, the, with the premise that uh, it, to do so would not affect our own national security. First and foremost, that's uh, primary. Um, I think what we have seen is it enabled some of our partners, both in the intelligence uh, lane, in the law enforcement lane, and in the policy lane, to address backlash within their own governments, within their own communities, to then unlock and enable additional sharing. Now, I think some of that also comes with time and moving away from uh, some of what has been described as more heat than light that yeah. the disclosures uh, generated. 
Some of it also is a recognition of the threat environment. So I think uh, on balance, it was both uh, not costly from our national security. It uh, enabled continued relationships uh, to not get stymied and, and to do the type of sharing that we need. Uh, it enabled us to maintain critical uh, relationships. Uh, and frankly, they are nimble decisions. In other words, uh, there is a mechanism that I think was probably addressed in one of the panels this morning to adjust uh, certain, um, certain decisions if there is a national security need to, need to do so. Uh, and that, is, uh, that has been a premise of all of these reforms, which is maintaining uh, nimbleness to, to take the actions that we need to. Well, thanks for that. Uh, and just in case you thought you were going to escape Austin uh, without talking about the FBI versus Apple, <laughs> uh, let, let me give you the opportunity to do so. Uh, and again, I'll catch people up from that conversation we were having at the table. So, you know, that case may be no longer relevant. Uh, there will be others. It was what we've discussed throughout our seminar this year as a classic privacy versus security yeah. debate. And that's cropped up in many, many different contexts. And so my question is less about what's the right answer. Where do we set that line today between how much security and how much privacy the American public wants? But rather the civics question mm -hmm. of how are we going to develop a national consensus around this? Because it seems we don't have one. So there have been examples just in the last several years. You mentioned USA Freedom Act. Well, this is an example of the legislature stepping up and on behalf of the people sort of setting that line, how they think that the balance should rest between security and, and, and privacy. Uh, the president himself, in the directive, he set the line. He ordered his executive branch agencies to do certain things and not mm -hmm. do certain things. And then we have uh, the court cases. Mm -hmm. So the courts are taking litigation one by one and making decisions. None of that seems you know, particularly promising in terms of taking us to that, the national consensus we're going to need to be safe and, and uh, have civil rights going forward. Congressman McCall uh, and Senator Warner have, have proposed legislation that would create a national commission, sort of a hybrid way to, to get at this. How, how do you think about this? What's the civics answer here? How, we, how are we as a country going to reach this consensus and make it durable and sound? So I would start by saying, um, first of all, this is one of the hardest policy problems we've confronted. Uh, and I think a number of folks who've engaged in discussions um, on this uh, inside the government would, would say exactly that. Um, the other is, I come to this personally from the standpoint of somebody who has had a career in law enforcement in, in the intelligence community as a prosecutor. So the notion that we would have a space that is impenetrable to the rule of law to lawful process is quite unsettling. I think it's unsettling for many people. I spoke about, um, uh, got into this a little bit in my remarks about the civics, you say. The, the notion that our social compact between citizens and their government would be not honored in a particular space is unsettling. The president talked about this um, actually here in Austin a few weeks ago at South by Southwest. By the same token, the hat I wear Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor to the President, one of the biggest threats we face is that of cyber threats and the importance of cybersecurity both across our government and uh, across our commercial institutions. Strong encryption is critical both to the government, to uh, confidence in our transactions on a host of levels. So there is absolute consensus across our government about the importance of having uh, strong encryption. I think um, how we're going to get to consensus is going to be a uh, series of discussions, like the commission that the, that the congressman has, has offered, like the uh, discussions that we've been having and leading uh, with uh, industry, with the private sector. But importantly, in order to have productive discussions, as the president said, we're going to have to move off of our absolutist positions on both sides. There are going to have to be trade-offs, and we're going to have to decide, as a great democracy does, for ourselves where we want to see that line. As the president remarked uh, here in Austin a couple weeks ago, uh, ultimately, uh, 
there's going to have to be a place where we move from the absolutist and identify that area that we all agree needs to be accessible with uh, lawful process, and how can we minimize and make most secure that, that pathway. Thank you. Part of what you're describing is that age-old axiom that uh, the easy problems don't get to the White House. Yeah. <laughs> They're solved somewhere else. We have some time for questions. Uh, if you'd please raise your hand and, and be brief, and also make sure that we have a question mark uh, at the end. I, I would be grateful for that. I know you, Admiral Inman. <laughs> for much of this audience, uh, digital world is, is their world throughout. Uh, I'm old enough that if you were reasonably discreet, your private life was private. <laughs> now it's out there all over the internet. Every time you get on the internet, <laughs> you're tracked everywhere you go for commercial purposes. <clears throat> so my uh, grenade <laughs> relates to what's privacy? When do we, we have a debate about encryption and security and national security. <clears throat> Where's the debate given our willingness to go put everything on the internet? <clears throat> How do we now define privacy and privacy that merits being protected? It's, I think it's, it's a great grenade uh, to throw because that has got to be part of the conversation and the consensus we end up at. I'll, I'll give you an anecdote. At the height of the disclosures controversy, I found myself getting up one morning, and as is my habit, go immediately to my BlackBerry, yes, BlackBerry, <laughs> Ouch. to check the email traffic. Then I went to my iPhone, my personal device. And the first thing that greets me is, Lisa, comma, it will take you 12 minutes to get to work today. Which was wonderful news, but I wondered how it was that my iPhone knew exactly that. And the answer is because it travels with me every time I leave my house at about six in the morning and travel down to the White House and it has conducted that uh, geolocation and has put it all together to make a recommendation to me about how long it was going to take me to get to work on the precise route that I take uh, every day. So uh, is that an invasion of my privacy? Is that a service that was being provided to me? Uh, is it something I asked for because I didn't turn off location services because I want to make sure that my pizza gets delivered? So. These are, we're making those choices every day, uh, and they're coming more and more to the fore, and they will in the discussion we're going to have uh, in the weeks and months and years to come. And can I recommend that you please start varying your roots? Yes. <laughs> Good tradecraft. Thanks. Others? Don't be shy. Is there a hand up? Larry Wright, how are you? Uh, we, we, we have a microphone. This is being streamed, so. Thanks. Continuing on this Apple and privacy debate, it seems like we're in the we're going on the assumption that it's only America that mm -hmm. has control over all this. And if if Apple, for instance, caved in to the, to the FBI's suggestion about opening a back door, there's so many other products out there already. It seems to me that essentially this debate is moot and over. Um, well, I, I don't think it's moot. Um, this one case was mooted out, uh, obviously, but I think the, the, um, the point I think you make, which is that this is not just a U.S. issue, is absolutely correct. And, and I should mention, that's um, something that is very much part of the discussions ongoing. In other words, we could, you know, divine a, a legislative solution and maybe even get it passed, but uh, where does that then drive others? Where does it drive other governments to do uh, ultimately this consensus, this elusive consensus that we're talking about here, uh, is ultimately going to have to include an international component. That's true both for people in the security business, in the seat that I occupy, because it's just going to drive the bad actors to other platforms. It's true for uh, the importance of our companies and what it means about their commercial uh, 
uh, and economic viability uh, on, on the international stage. So to think that this is just a U.S. debate or a U.S. problem is certainly not the case, and, and it's certainly something that I hear from my international counterparts uh, constantly. I think we have time for one more, and I'm looking for a student, if I can. Grades <laughs> hang in the balance. Uh, please, I don't think you're in my class, but I'll call on you anyway. <laughs> Uh, my name is Ben McNally. I'm a junior here majoring in international okay. relations. Um, in your talk, you talked a lot about the increasing importance of intelligence uh, in our national security apparatus. And um, I'm curious, uh, after 9-11, uh, the United States government, for lack of a better term, was caught with its pants down. And um, when President Bush asked the team who's got a plan, uh, the CIA was basically the only people that raised their hand, and as a result, the CIA did something that was sort of foreign to them, which was prescribing policy. And in the tradition of the CIA, they're not supposed to prescribe policy, they're supposed to inform it. And I'm curious, uh, given your, the fact that you uh, emphasize the increasing importance of intelligence, does that mean that uh, the intelligence community will become uh, more prescriptive in its policy uh, informing rather than just merely trying to inform policy? Um, it's a good question. and. I think that, as I mentioned in my remarks, making sure that um, intelligence is free of politics, political wins, uh, is critical. I, I mentioned I have a prosecutorial background. The same is absolutely true of the investigative and prosecutive function that, for instance, the Department of Justice uh, has. Um, that is critical because of the both the power that prosecutors wield to uh, take away somebody's liberty, uh, but also to have co public confidence in the institutions of our government uh, and the most powerful ones like prosecutors. Same is true for intelligence. If they don't maintain that uh, divide uh, and inform policymakers rather than make policy, I think we will uh, have lost our way. And uh, so, as a policymaker, it is, it is critical to me to have that unbiased, unvarnished, very clear, I don't want somebody telling me what they think I want to hear. I want them telling me facts informed by rigorous uh, analysis. And that, then it's up to the policymakers to make hard uh, decisions about what to do with that. Thank you, that's a great description of the profession. Uh, join me please in thanking Lisa. Thank you. Well done. Thanks very much. Thank you. It's great to see you. Thanks for coming down here. Yes. We're headed. We're headed back downstairs. I think my mic is off. People know where we.